Hello, and welcome to part 19 of the Unsolved Mysteries Mega Iceberg Explained. Tonight, we begin our descent down into layer 7 as we inch closer and closer to the bottom. And as always, I want to give a shout out to the members who make this channel possible. Their generous support means everything to me. And if you would like to help the channel, there's a join button below. Or, most importantly, just liking, sharing, and subscribing. Now, get the hot chocolate out. Get under that throw blanket as we dive down into a new layer on the iceberg. February 2006. The Washington Post would do an article on a hacker named 0x80 who ran a lucrative business running botnets, which is networks of remotely controlled personal computers without the owner's consent. In fact, the hacker had access to 13,000 computers in over 20 countries. In this article, 0x80 would document his earnings of around 7,000 a month, just infecting controlled personal computers with adware and spyware in exchange for a per computer commission from marketing companies that pay for advertisements to be delivered to users. Now this would normally be the everyday news interview that didn't really stand out much, except for one thing. 0x80, who agreed only to the interview as long as he was not identified by name or hometown, would have a photo taken of himself smoking at his laptop. You could only see from the nose down, so no identification was possible. But one curious reader would take a program that allowed him to read the metadata and quickly found that 0x80's picture was taken in Roland, Oklahoma, a small town of about 3,000 people. As soon as this was discovered, the Washington Post immediately removed all the images from the site, saying they took their obligation to sources very seriously and would not comment further on the matter. Now there's not a lot on this one, as almost everything from the article has been scrubbed from the internet. Even the wiki article has recently been deleted, but it's been over a decade and this guy has still not been identified and probably never will. Philip K. Dick may be the most important figure in 20th century science fiction. He penned 44 novels and 121 short stories, which mostly appeared in science fiction magazines. His stories frequently explored varied philosophical and social questions, and the characters often struggled against alternate realities and altered states of consciousness. So it might not be a shock to learn that between March and April of 1974, he would have his own paranormal experience. It started on February 20th, when he was recovering from the effects of sodium pentothal, which had been administered while having his wisdom tooth removed. He would receive a home delivery of Darvon from a young woman whom, when he opened the door, was struck by her beauty and was drawn to her golden necklace. He would ask about the curious fish-shaped design, and as she was leaving, she told him it was a sign used by the early Christians. As she left, Dick recalled that the sun glinted off the pendant, causing a pink beam of light which mesmerized him. He came to believe that beam impacted wisdom and clairvoyance, and he believed it to be intelligent. After she left, he began to experience strange hallucinations, to which he originally believed were side effects of the painkillers. But after weeks of these hallucinations, he found this implausible. This mystery, called 2374, is based on what Dick would call these hallucinations which occurred over February and March of 1974. Aside from the pink beam he continued to see, he would also note geometric patterns and occasionally, if briefly, pictures of Jesus and ancient Rome. The hallucinations increased in duration and frequency, leaving Dick to believe he was living two parallel lives, one as himself and the other as Thomas a Christian persecuted by the Romans in the first century AD. He became so obsessed with his visions, he wrote 1,000 odd pages called the Exegesis in which he dissected the visions for the rest of his life. He would question, were these visions from God, telepathic aliens, a vastly intelligent computer that ran the universe, or maybe he had been programmed with a secret message to be hypnotically triggered at a later date. Regardless, this was not viewed as a mental breakdown by Dick. Instead, he seen it as a breakthrough. He had stepped behind the scenes and viewed the truth, claiming that 2374 saved the world, which leads to the thought that maybe 
This was all some sort of mental illness, because after 2374, Dick continued to suffer severe depressions, an attempted suicide, and started sedating anti-anxiety drugs. Another theory comes from the journalist, Jason Louve, who claimed that Philip K. Dick experienced 2374 after smoking too much meth, although some dispute this and claim that Dick was taking speed that had been prescribed, which may have caused the illusions. These are names I am confident I will not pronounce correctly, so I apologize in advance. Our story begins on the morning of May 16, 2008, in Noida, India, when a housemaid for the Tawar family, an affluent family consisting of Dr. Rajesh Tawar and his wife, Dr. Nupur Tawar, and 13-year-old daughter, Arushi. Now, this housemaid had only been employed six days earlier, but in this short time, she had learned that both doctors were late risers, so when she rang the doorbell at 6 a.m., she expected the live-in domestic servant, 45-year-old Hemraj Banjadi, to answer it, but he did not. Even after the second time she rang it, she would push on the outermost gate in an effort to let herself in, but she could not get through. She would ring the bell a third time, and finally, Nooper would open the innermost door and speak through a mesh grill inside the door and tell the housemaid the door was locked to wait on Hamraj, who probably went outside to get milk. But the housemaid asked not to wait, so Nooper would then call Hamraj on his mobile phone, but the call was cut abruptly. She would try calling him again, but it appeared he had turned his phone off, so she threw the keys from the balcony down to the housemaid, who went in. By now, all the commotion had woken Rajesh, who walked into the living room to see a nearly empty scotch whiskey bottle on the dining table, surprising him. He immediately went into his daughter Arushi's room, but her door was self-locking, so he had to fetch the key. When he entered, he would shockingly see her dead body on the bed. He began to scream, while Nooper remained silent, as she was in shock, according to her. By this time, the housemaid was in and walked into the scene and saw both parents crying while noticing their daughter's throat had been slit. The parents both stated Hamraj must be responsible for her murder. They dismissed the housemaid and called the police. Just kidding. They called family and friends. Finally, a neighbor who lived below them would ask a security guard to call the police. By the time they arrived, there were 15 people in the living room and five to six in the bedroom, totally trampling over the crime scene. Of course, since they were an affluent family in an affluent neighborhood, this attracted much media interest. Hamraj was immediately labeled as the suspect by police, with Rajesh repeatedly telling them to go look for him instead of hanging around their apartment wasting time. They suspected after drinking, he went into her room and tried to assault her. She resisted and he killed her with a knife. Her body was taken in for an autopsy. Now, everything from here on out is he said, she said type of thing and the truth is unknown, but the police would claim later on that the Tawars suspiciously rushed to have her body cremated. However, the Tawars claimed the body was decomposing fast and that they were told by the police that the body was no longer needed. The police then claimed that the domestic staff quickly cleaned up the room, while the domestic staff claimed they had received permission from the police to clean up the room as the crime scene analysis was complete. Then, the bloodstained mattress was cut and sent to a lab, along with her pillow, sheet, and clothes. The domestic staff would then dump the remaining mattress onto the terrace that was locked, and they had to go get a key for it. But strangely that morning, the friends and family that were invited over shortly after the murder, yeah, some of these people would call the police and report they had seen bloodstains on the terrace door, and its lock and the staircase leading to it. Of course, other witnesses claimed this was false, including the police officers, so it was assumed that these things were caused by the domestic staff who were trying to take the mattress out to the terrace. However, other visitors from that morning would call on police again to please go check the terrace, even though the police had already dismissed the blood spots on the door and rug as evidence that the killer had tried to escape using the terrace, but left another way upon finding the door locked. Regardless, they would finally give in to the pressure and decide to go look at it. But when police asked Rajesh for the key, he went inside the house and did not come out for a long time, which Rajesh stated he could not recall happening. 
Regis did come back, however, and stated that he did not have a key and he could not open the door. He then left to immerse his daughter's ashes in the Ganges River as part of the Hindu custom. Police would eventually have to break open the lock, and on the terrace, they seen bloody drag marks and a decomposing body in a pool of blood. Rajesh and Nooper would be called home and stated they could not identify the body due to decomposition, but a friend of Hamraj's would later be called in to confirm that it was indeed him. And just a FYI at this point, the crime scene had still not been secured, and an estimated 90% of the evidence at the crime scene was destroyed. But it had been established that both Arushi and Hamraj died between 12 and 1 a.m. They had been first attacked with a blunt weapon, possibly a golf club found at the home, which caused a U or a V-shaped scar. Then their throats were slit, and strangely, both of their phones disappeared afterwards. This mystery has a lot of twists and turns and could easily take an hour or more to cover. So I'm just kind of going to state what happened and then fill in some of the details. After ruling out the domestic servants, the parents became the main suspects. They believed that Rajesh had caught the 45-year-old Hamraj and his daughter in a questionable position and snapped. Or it was because Hamraj had discovered Rajesh was having an affair and started blackmailing him. Rajesh then killed his daughter to silence her on the murder as well as the affair that she had also learned of. However, the Talwars claimed that the police botched the investigation from the beginning, which they did, and that they were trying to cover up for themselves. The case was transferred to the CBI, which I kind of gather is the Indian version of the FBI, who exonerated the parents and suspected the domestic servants instead. But these servants were interrogated narco style, which means they were using psychoactive drugs to attain information from them which obviously didn't go over well. So the CBI team handed the case to another team who dropped the investigation of the domestic staff and again accused Rajesh as the sole suspect. But they refused to charge him because there was not enough evidence. The parents opposed this report, claiming suspicion of Rajesh was baseless. But in a twist, a court ordered that there was now enough evidence to pursue a trial. And in November 2013, the parents were convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment amid criticism that the judgment was based on weak evidence. And if this story wasn't crazy enough, the Tawars successfully challenged the decision in 2017 and were released and the case remains unsolved. Now as far as the details for the parents being guilty go, their bedroom was seven to eight feet away from Arushi's and they claimed they slept through the whole thing. Then, the way the police were rushed out of the house to go look for Hamraj was seen as a diversion and the way that Rajesh ignored police's request to open the terrace door, as well as the fact that someone had tried to hide Hamraj's body. Rajesh also pretended he didn't know it was Hamraj's body. Then they quickly cremated Arushi's body. Witnesses claimed that they displayed no grief and looked nervous, and Hamraj had told friends that someone was threatening to kill him weeks before, presumably because he knew about Rajesh's alleged affair. However, the Tawaris had answers for all this. First, the air conditioners were so loud that they could not hear Arushi's room. This was confirmed by a sound expert team. They also denied tampering with the crime scene, pointing out that they left a bottle of scotch for everyone to see. And also, they did not rush to cremate their daughter's body. The police had given them the okay to do it. And as for the key, Rajesh claimed he didn't remember the police asking for the keys to the terrace. And finally, their friends and family said they showed a lot of grief. To this day, most still point the finger at the parents and claim that the police botched the investigation so bad that it allowed them off the hook, while others defend the parents and claim that one or more of the servants were involved. And there is more about the servants that I just kind of skimmed over, but for the most part, they seem to have been cleared by law enforcement. Regardless, everyone all around agrees that the police mishandled the investigation from the start. But I'd like to know what you think. Was it the parents or someone else? Let me know in the comment section below. April 10th, 2021. A ram would unveil feeding gas to several centrifuges on what was called National Nuclear Technology Day, a day that made several nations, particularly Israel, nervous. Prior to this, Iran was allegedly going by a deal which imposed restrictions on their critical nuclear facilities. 
but it's the next day that our mystery would take place. Because early on that Sunday, a blackout that seemed to have been caused by a deliberately planned blast hit the Natanz nuclear facility, which caused damage to the electrical distribution grid. There would be different reports of the incident, including a cyber attack and an explosion, but Iran refused to reveal further information since it was a national security issue, and Israel would not approve or deny that they were responsible for the incident. However, U.S. and Israel intelligence officials have claimed that it was a cyber attack by Israel. The Israeli media even said the operation was carried out by Mossad. An Iranian diplomat would claim that the incident was sabotage and nuclear terrorism, although the attack caused no casualties or pollution. According to the Israeli media, the blackout had struck a blow to Iran's uranium enrichment program. The mayor of Tehran confirmed this, saying it damaged several thousand centrifuges. Of course, Iran blamed Israel for the accident, going so far as to call the cyber attack a war crime due to the high risk of potential release of radioactive material. The move was believed to have set Iran's nuclear program back by about nine months. I'm not sure why this mystery is on here. I mean, everyone pretty much knows who was behind it. Maybe the mystery is how they did it. You have no doubt heard of the Ark of the Covenant, even if you're not a religious person. Hearing the words alone will probably make many of you remember the Indiana Jones movie. But what was it exactly? And what happened to it? The legendary artifact is said to be an ornate golden case built about 3,000 years ago by the Israelites to house the Ten Commandments. From the biblical description, it is fairly large, about four feet long, two feet high and wide, covered in pure gold, and topped with two large golden angels called a mercy seat. And it was carried using poles inserted through rings on its sides. Inside was two stone tablets with the Ten Commandments. And according to the New Testament, it also contained Aaron's rod, which was a walking stick, carried by Moses' brother Aaron, as well as containing a pot of manna, which was some kind of edible substance. The ark was created according to a pattern given to Moses by God when the Israelites were encamped at the foot of Mount Sinai, and then carried 2,600 feet in advance of the Israelites on their march through the desert. When they camped, it was stored in a sacred tent called the Tabernacle. The ark would then go on to be linked to several miracles in the Bible. It was said to have cleared impediments and poisonous animals from the path of Israelites as they left Egypt. And when they crossed the Jordan River, the Bible says the river stopped flowing the moment the ark bearers stepped foot in it. Many others assert that when the Israelites besieged Jericho, they carried the ark around the city for a week while sounding the seven trumpets of ram's horn, and on the seventh day, the walls fell down, allowing an easy conquest. But even this powerful weapon could not stop the evil to come, which happened in 597 and 586 BC, when the Babylonian Empire would conquer the Israelites, and the Ark of the Covenant, which was supposed to be stored in the Temple of Jerusalem, would vanish. And in the centuries since, theologians, as well as historians alike, wonder what actually happened to it. Was it destroyed or stolen by the Babylonians? Did the Israelites just hide it and its location was lost to time? Well, if you've heard this story before, you probably know the most famous alleged location of the Ark of the Covenant. That is, in Ethiopia. To be more specific, the town of Aksum, in a cathedral called St. Mary of Zion, a story called the Kebra Nagast, which is like the national epic of Ethiopia, tells us that before the Babylonians were able to destroy Jerusalem, the Ark found its way out and down into Ethiopia, where it was hidden and remains under guard to this day. How this happened is a bit mysterious. It seems that Emperor Menelik I of Ethiopia left a forgery at the temple in Jerusalem and with divine assistance was able to smuggle it out of the country and back home with him. Which sounds like a logical story, right? Well, except for whatever reason, the church authorities have one man who is now the sole guardian of the Ark, whom changes every time the guardian dies. This one guardian is the only person allowed to see the Ark which means it's impossible for an outsider to study and verify its authenticity, assuming that it's really there. Which leads to my next point. British scholar and historian Edward Ollendorf claimed he actually got to examine the Ark in 1941 while he was there as a British Army officer. 
He stated it was nothing more than an empty wooden box that dated back to the medieval period. So there goes that. So if it's not Ethiopia, where to look next? Let's stay in Africa, because it's here. The Limba people of South Africa and Zimbabwe have claimed that the Ark was carried further south past Ethiopia by way of Yemen and was hid in a deep cave in the Dumga Mountains. This comes from the fact that the Limba people have their own legend that has been passed down from their ancestors that tells a very similar story to that of the Ark of the Covenant. In their version, an object called the Voice of God that was a similar size to the Ark of the Covenant was carried on poles by priests and was not allowed to touch the ground. This artifact was also used as a weapon of great power, able to sweep enemies to the side. Unfortunately, their legend also states that after the Ark was with the Limba people for some time, it self-destructed. So, uh, yeah, let's move on. After this, the theories are a little less known and reported, albeit maybe a little more believable. One claim is that the Ark was actually hidden in a maze of tunnels beneath the first temple of Jerusalem before the Babylonians destroyed it in 586. However, that theory cannot be tested because that location is now the site of the Dome of the Rock Shrine, which is sacred in Islam. Another theory states that the Ark was never moved to Jerusalem until much later, probably during the reign of King Josiah between 640 and 609 BC. This is further backed up by 2 Chronicles 35.3, which tells us that King Josiah told the Levites to put the holy box in the temple that Solomon built and not to carry it from place to place on their shoulders like they used to. Of course, you also have to mention off-the-wall theories that it found its way to Rome or to some far away place like New Guinea. Some also cite that it was taken to several different places by the Knights Templar, including that of the United States. Finally, an even crazier theory is that the Ark story was not even written until the 8th century AD when an independent writer penned a text called Ark Narrative. It's believed that story was then taken and put into the Bible much later on. And one last observation. Assuming they do find an artifact that fits the description, how does one determine it's the same one from the Bible? September 13th, 2012, Auckland, New Zealand. A harbor worker named Brad Watson would spot something that, well, kind of got him curious. He would quickly reach for his phone and snap a picture of the tail end of what looked like a long, sleek craft ghosting along the waterfront at around 11.30 a.m. The photo, believed to be a submarine, was looked at by the New Zealand Coast Guard, who had no idea what it was. It was only made odder by the fact that it took place in front of the Via Duck Harbor, the busiest neighborhood in Auckland, and no one else reported seeing it. 360 Discover Cruises, which runs tours of the area, looked at the picture and could not identify it. Neither could the people who worked the harbor every day. One employee, who spent most of the day on the harbor bridge, would say she had not seen anything unusual and insisted she would have heard about it if something like this had really occurred. Leaving the question, did Brad Watson really snap a photograph of a submarine that was able to get this close to Auckland shore? If so, from where? Russia? China? Or was this some elaborate hoax by someone else and Brad fell for it? Or was the whole thing a hoax by Brad himself? October 25th, 1974. 41-year-old Carl Higdon decided to take the day off to elk hunt at Medicine Bow National Park in Wyoming. Higdon was in for some luck that day because a group of elk would walk out in front of him when he quietly raised his rifle and aimed at the largest male. As soon as he pulled the trigger, he knew something odd had happened. Actually, it was something that didn't happen. The rifle did not kick back, and even stranger, there was no sound of the gunshot. And if you're thinking, it was a misfire, well, it wasn't that, because Carl claimed he was actually able to watch the bullet leave the barrel and soar forward so slowly that it looked like it was going through a wall of invisible jello. The bullet flew only a few meters and sharply fell to the ground, as if it had hit something invisible. Carl went over to pick the bullet up and saw that it was flattened by something very strong. And if you thought that was strange, buckle in, because Carl would hear the noise of branches crunching, and he turned around to see this human figure in the bushes, that being 
was six foot tall, was wearing a skin tight black one piece outfit that Carl claimed was similar to a wetsuit scuba divers wore. Atop the suit was a pair of harness like straps that crisscrossed his chest. Below that was a metallic belt adorned with a large yellow six pointed star. Beneath the star was an insignia Carl could not identify. The being had no visible ears and its eyes were small and lacked brows. The dome of his skull was covered with incredibly coarse hair, almost like he had straw growing out of his head. Its mouth was lipless, and instead was slit-like, which concealed three exceptionally large teeth on top and the bottom, a pair of antennas, and the thing that stood out to Carl the most was its face, which blended directly into its neck. It also had a pointy, almost drill-like appendage sticking out of its wrist, where its right hand should have been, and nothing on the left at all. The bizarre alien-like being slowly approached Carl, who was obviously frightened, and asked, How you doing? Which the account does not record, if Carl thought that was a pickup line. Instead, Carl, who was pretty freaked out, replied, Pretty good. The extraterrestrial would then ask Carl if he was hungry, but before he could reply, the being sent a small clear cellophane package floating towards him which contained four pills. The alien said it would keep him full for the day, so Carl took one and kept the others in his pocket. The strange jawless humanoid then introduced himself as also one. That's when Carl would notice a strange box-like transparent object in the sun's rays behind the creature. It had no entrance, window, or landing gear. Also one, noticing Carl staring at his ship, asked Carl, do you want to come along? Carl shrugged his shoulders, sure, and it was at this point the time seemed to leap forward. Carl's next recollection was being inside this cube-like craft and being given a tour of also one's home planet. It's here, 163,000 light years from Earth, that Carl seen this huge tower that had many colored lights revolving around like powerful searchlights. He then seen a group of people outside and also told him that his race regularly flies to Earth for hunting. Carl was then scanned by some device and also told him he was not suitable for their purpose and would take him back home, which he did. Carl then found himself in a forest, disoriented and frightened. He wandered around until he found his truck. He then gave a distress signal over the radio and waited for help. A search party would find him, and it turned out his truck was at the bottom of a deep forest canyon, five miles from where he had parked. There were no roads nearby and no tire tracks leading down to the gorge. When found, he was so confused that he just kept talking about the bullet. That now flattened bullet was found in his pocket. The other memories would come out later through regressive hypnosis. The strangest of all was that the scars left from long-term tuberculosis disappeared from his lungs as well as his kidney stones. The trip had somehow cured him. Obviously, the most common theory on this one is hoax, that Carl made the whole thing up to become famous. But one thing that cannot be disproven it's just how Carl's truck got down in that canyon anyway. No tire tracks, and the recovery vehicle got stuck several times just trying to get to him. June 20th, 1994, Dunedin, New Zealand. 22-year-old David Bain was returning home from his morning paper run when he walked into an absolute nightmare. There his family lay dead, his 58-year-old father, Robin, his 50-year-old mother, Margaret, 19-year-old sister, Urwawa, 18-year-old sister, Laniet, and his brother Stephen, 14, all dead by gunshot wound. He would obviously call the emergency number at 7.09 a.m. and in a distressed state would tell the operator, they're all dead, they're all dead. Going over the crime scene, detectives found on the computer a top message that read, sorry, you are the only one who deserved to stay, which was obviously meant as a message to David. Who could do such an awful thing? Well, that is a mystery that is still unknown, at least officially. But David, yeah, he would be arrested four days later and charged with five counts of murder. And like a lot of these cases that make it to the iceberg, a lot of them get here by way of police incompetence. It turns out that on the day of the murders, detectives sprayed luminal and found bloody sock prints. And what did they do with this critical piece of evidence? Nothing. And then two weeks later, the extended Bain family, who were obviously grieving, asked for the home to be burnt down. And not only was this approved, 
but no one bothered to go cut the bloody sock prints out of the carpet, destroying the most critical piece of evidence in the process. David, meanwhile, would still go on trial. The Crown's case was that David shot his mother, two sisters, and brother before going on his paper run at 5.45 a.m. He returned an hour later and typed a computer message and waited in the lounge for his father to walk in before shooting him in the head and calling police. The defense, however, claimed that his father, Robin, had killed his wife and children, then typed the message on the computer and committed suicide, and David returned home and called the police. So a really classic whodunit. The defense did find one early key witness who was going to testify the 18-year-old Laniant was having an incestuous relationship with her father, and Robin, well, he was the school principal and ex-missionary, and there was no way he could live with the public revelation of his incestuous relationship with his daughter getting out, and that was the motive. But this witness failed to show up. He did provide a written statement, and the judge ruled him as an unreliable witness and ruled against it. There's more about this alleged incestuous relationship that I'll come back to in a second. Strangely though, David would be convicted and sentenced to life in prison, but an interesting person would enter the scene, that of former professional rugby player Joe Karam, who'd become interested in the case in 1996 after reading an article about university students raising money for David's appeal. He gave them money and studied the evidence at the trial and felt David had been done terribly wrong, so he started a campaign to have the conviction overturned visiting him in prison over 200 times and writing four books about the case. He was convinced he was totally innocent. Karim, who was a millionaire with 20 investment properties, would use a considerable portion of his own wealth in helping David. He would work full-time on the case until his appeal in 2003, and he lost an estimated $4 million doing so. In that time, he also lost friends, his home, and a woman who loved him, all in the pursuit of fighting an injustice. Karim, who was now labeled as a freedom fighter, would finally help bring a retrial in 2009, which David was found not guilty. The jury took less than a day, and in an odd turn, hugged David after his not guilty verdict and had a victory party with him. And as usual, with the wheels of justice, time moved slow, because apparently, six years after the murders in 2000, the Ministry of Justice concluded that the investigation had shown a number of errors had occurred in the Crown's case against David, which was more frustrating since the New Zealand Court of Appeals had looked at the case just a year after the murder and decided everything was fine. Most damning was the motive. His father had one. David did not. Or did he? David claimed he had a warm relationship with his father. However, people that knew David claimed he stated he hated him, but it was David's sister's friends who noted other bizarre behavior. 19-year-old Ara was friends, said David was controlling and threatening, and there was some alleged evidence that he was keeping tight tabs on them. Laniant's friend would even say that David would get jealous of her relationships with other boys, and thought that the brother and sister acted more like boyfriend and girlfriend. And according to some, Laniant in particular was scared of David having a rifle in the home. The family, who showed a happy appearance on the outside, seemed to be having many issues on the inside, Robin and Laniant were actually living away from the home much of the time, which may be the source for the incest claims. Robin would come back home on the weekends and live in a van in the backyard. David and his mother Margaret had connected bedrooms and were hoping to keep the home to themselves, or at least a home that included no Robin. Speaking of Margaret, she had gotten into some new age spiritual movement and had wanted to turn the home into a sanctuary, although she told some friends she just wanted to sell and moved to a townhouse with the youngest son, Stephen, and Laniant had no plans of returning home full-time. Meanwhile, Erwawa was talking about moving in with friends because she didn't get along with her mother or David, so there were clearly a lot of problems, and David's claims of a happy family was a lie, as they were dysfunctional. So back to the claims between Laniant and her father, Robin. As mentioned, this witness never showed up at the trial, and that testimony was thrown out but there would be more witnesses come forward during the investigation. But since Laniette was a sex worker, and most of these witnesses were sex workers, it was largely dismissed by the police, until practically the whole neighborhood would begin to tell them they also heard these rumors. These rumors had started from Laniette herself, and I'm not trying to discredit the claims, but there is some question to how much of this was true, because she was on drugs 
and apparently had made a lot of other claims that I won't get into that, well, they were unsubstantiated, but it's these same friends of hers that would claim that Laniet had intended to go home that weekend to finally expose her father for the improper relationship, and that's what caused the murders. But the Crown claimed this was not the case at all, and instead claimed that Laniet came back because David had called a family meeting and threatened to drag her there kicking and screaming if she did not come. Oh, and by the way, that's because at this point, David was trying to show he was the man of the house. Furthermore was the other evidence, such as Robin's fingerprints were not on the gun that he allegedly killed himself with, but David's were, prompting the question, how did his father kill his whole family and then commit suicide but leave no prints? But that's not all. David could not account for 20 to 25 minutes of time between coming home and discovering the bodies and calling police, leading many to believe he was cleaning up his clothes after the murders and altering the crime scene. There were also fresh injuries to his hand and face which could not be accounted for, which is believed to come from a struggle with his brother Stephen, because in Stephen's room there was evidence that showed a fierce struggle had taken place. But there's also his bloody palm print, which was found on the washing machine, where David allegedly went to wash his blood-soaked shirt. There was also the paramedic who testified that David faked a seizure when they first arrived. There's even the admission by a friend that David had told him he planned to assault a female jogger on his paper route that he had taken a liking to, and even included details that he would finish his paper run earlier, allowing him to have a suitable alibi, just like he did with the murders. Now before I leave you with the thought that it was definitely David, I'll point out one more odd fact. Remember those bloody sock prints that were on the carpet? Although the police screwed up by not collecting that piece of carpet, they did take measurements, and they had David at one point put on a sock that had been soaked in cow's blood, and he would then leave sock prints on the carpet. His prints were too big to match the one left by the killer, presumably his father. And with that, I'll let you decide. I'm dying to know what you all think. Was it David or Robin? Let me know in the comment section below. On the morning of December 15th, 2017, Toronto, real estate agents were showing a couple of prospective buyers a beautiful home. This home belonged to power couple Barry and Honey Sherman. Both in their 70s, Barry was the founder and owner of Apotex, a major pharmaceutical company that produces generic drugs in Canada. The two controlled over $3 billion, and Mr. Sherman was the 12th richest man in Canada but Hume and Honey made good use of the money, as they were noted philanthropists, and Mrs. Sherman particularly served on boards of several charities. So suffice to say, this was a nice looking home, and I can only imagine the realtor's reaction when walking out to the pool area, they would come across the bodies of both Barry and Honey. Their bodies were fully clothed on the pool deck, and both of their necks had been tied with leather belts to the metal railing surrounding the pool. Barry was in a seated position with legs crossed, while Mrs. Sherman was lying on her side with a bruise on her face. These positions seemed to mirror a 1970s era junk sculpture of human figures posed sitting on speakers in the basement. It's unknown if this was intentional or not. Honey's cell phone, which she rarely used, was found in the bathroom, which suggested she may have went in there to call for help before being overpowered. Similarly, Barry's gloves and paperwork related to an inspection for a house were left on the floor just outside the garage door. Once police arrived and taped off the scene, detectives would begin their investigation. After surveying the area, they would actually come back and say there was no sign of a break-in. However, they did eventually find that a window in the house had been left open to air out a room that had just been painted, as well as a basement door that was unlocked, which was commonly done by the couple, explaining why there was no sign of a break-in. However, Media would soon speculate that the police were postulating that it was a murder-suicide. It's important to note here that police never officially said that, but according to journalists, several sources within the police department did divulge that, which infuriated the family, who believed that someone came in through the unlocked door and killed them. And this family, who obviously had a lot of pull in the Toronto area, demanded the police investigate their deaths as a criminal investigation. And it only got worse from here, as the family would continually criticize the Toronto Police Department for what they perceived as bumbling the investigation. 
It's because of this, the Sherman children hired private investigators and lawyers to look into their deaths. And they were right too, because a second autopsy was ordered that finally put the murder-suicide theory to rest. It was now officially a double murder. In the first four years of the investigation, police interviewed more than 200 witnesses and obtained more than 41 warrants to secure records of various types. Maybe the biggest lead came from the couple's home security system, which showed a man walking near their home on the night of the murder. Police believe he is the suspect. Detectives would also put together a timeline and discovered that the Shermans were last seen alive two days earlier on the 13th at the Apple Tech's headquarters, where they were going over designs for a new house they were building, hence the reason for selling their old home. Honey planned to go to Miami days later, with Barry joining her a week later. That evening, Barry sent an email to staff, but he did not call them, which his employees would say this was odd as he reportedly suffered from insomnia and would call them regularly. But as far as suspects go, detectives had nothing because it turns out Barry had a ton of enemies. While him and Honey were praised for their philanthropy, Barry was widely hated for his business dealings. Rival generic drug companies despised him, while law professor Amir Atarin described him as a deplorable human being in reference to his business practices because he was seemingly able to manipulate the system. Canadians paid some of the highest rates in the world for generic drugs solely because of Barry. His company at times had more than 100 legal battles going on at once concerning intellectual property rights. He would challenge drug patents to have other products removed so only Apotex's was left, where he would then set the price even higher. Sherman himself would even interview with Jeffrey Robinson for his book, Prescription Games, and Barry said branded drug companies hired private investigators to be on him all the time. Barry even questioned why they had not hired someone to kill him. And Barry wasn't just imagining this. Reportedly, private investigators working for Bayer considered planting illegal drugs in his car in one operation. They hoped it would lead to his employees informing on whether Barry was knowingly infringing on Bayer's patents. But it wasn't just other companies. Barry had filed 1,200 cases against the federal court. The spokesman for Health Canada stated Barry had cost in Canadian taxpayers millions of dollars in legal fees. Some would even claim the company had began to bully the Canadian government. Barry even bragged to employees that Apotex was a legal company that just sold medications on the side. Similarly, in his partial draft of his unpublished memoir, he stated he did not believe in God, free will, altruism, or morality, and that life had no meaning other than to achieve. A little over two years after the murder, in April 2019, Toronto police stated they had a working theory of the case and an idea of what had happened. And then similarly, at the end of 2019, the private investigators working for the family closed their investigation, and that was pretty much it. As far as suspects go, there were many. Many of his business associates had criminal records and were angered by his actions. And he even stated he was surprised no one had paid someone to kill him yet. Most intriguingly was some of his family. See, Barry got his start in the pharmaceutical business in the late 60s when his uncle, Louis Lloyd Winter, let him run Empire Laboratories. This led to him selling the company and then forming Apotex. However, he was supposed to give 5% stakes to Louis's four kids, which shocker, he never did. They would eventually sue him for $1 billion in 2011. The case was dismissed, however, and Barry won a ruling that stated the Winters family had to pay $300,000 for his court fees. This all happened just three months before Barry was murdered. However, this never led to any member of the Winters family being arrested. In January 2022, documents released by the court showed Barry owed $1 billion to other companies which he had told everyone he would never pay. These documents also revealed that the Sherman estate is part of the investigation. However, the most common theory now, at least by online sleuths, was that the Sherman's own son, Jonathan, was behind it. First of all, it was no secret that Jonathan and Honey did not get along. Actually, they despised each other, which might be why Honey was found with the bruised up face. Barry and Jonathan had a tense back and forth relationship that was good at times, but just weeks before they were murdered, Barry had shared in an email with someone saying that Jonathan was being hostile again. And just two weeks before the murders, Barry had asked Jonathan for tens of millions of dollars back that he had loaned him for his storage business. 
and even stranger. Just a couple of weeks before, Jonathan flew to Japan where he created a cryptocurrency account and deposited large sums of money and transferred it to an unknown account. Many think this might have paid for a hitman. There's also the fact that Jonathan hired his own private detective to investigate the murder. This investigator was retired Toronto police detective Doug Grady. Jonathan's three sisters did not like this hire and spoke out about it, and it caused a rift between them. And that may be because Grady was seen more as a person that came in and interfered with the police investigation instead of actually trying to solve the case. It's also possible he could have advised on how to cover one's tracks. There's also the fact that the home was destroyed shortly after the murder, and none of the children went into the home to collect items such as family photos. There's also the question of how many people knew that the family kept that one door unlocked. It seems like it would be somebody close that knew that. But finally, and maybe the most interesting, his own sister in recent interviews has pointed the finger at him. In 1885, a pamphlet entitled The Bill Papers would tell the story of a man named Thomas J. Bill. Bill, who lived in the early 1800s, would lead a group of 30 men from Virginia to the West. At some point, they would reach the Spanish province of Santa Fe, New Mexico, most likely an area that is today Colorado. Bill and his men would go buffalo hunting, and it's here they would come across a splendid surprise because they stumbled up onto a rich mine of gold and silver. The men would spend the next year and a half mining thousands of pounds of these metals, which they then entrusted Bill with transporting back to Virginia and hiding in a secure location. Bill would take multiple trips to stock it in a hiding place and then encrypted three messages. One was the location, the other a description of the treasure, and finally the names of its owners and relatives. And although the exact location is unknown, it is traditionally believed to be in Montvale, Virginia. The ciphertext were placed in an iron box and in 1822, Bill entrusted this box to a Lynchburg innkeeper named Robert Morris. Bill told him not to open it unless he or his men failed to return from their journey within 10 years. He did send a letter from St. Louis a few months later and promised Morris that a friend in St. Louis would mail the key to the cryptograms. However, it never arrived. And it wasn't until over 20 years later that Morris finally decided to look inside the box. Inside, he found two letters from Bill, along with several passages of ciphertext, separated into three papers. And Morris had no luck in solving them, and he would eventually leave the box and its contents to a friend. That friend, using the United States Declaration of Independence as the key, successfully deciphered the second ciphertext, which gave a description of the buried treasure. But that's as far as he got. Which brings us back to the beginning, because this friend would take the letters and text to a friend who was a publisher, James B. Ward, and they made the contents public in 1885 in a pamphlet called The Bill Papers. But as mentioned, the second one has been deciphered, and according to that, the treasure's total weight is about three tons, which is a mix of gold, silver, and jewels, with an estimated total of about $43 million. So, is any of this legit? One early researcher in the late 1960s actually used a supercomputer to analyze the ciphers and found that while they were poorly encoded, the two unciphered texts showed patterns expected of an unciphered text and were not just a bunch of random numbers, and that once deciphered, it probably encoded an intelligible text. But there's a lot of doubters. One researcher claimed the whole story had enough red flags that indicated it was a hoax. While later cryptographers have claimed the ciphers have statistical characteristics which suggest they are not actually encryptions of an English plain text. Also, why would Bill write three ciphertexts for one single message if he wanted to ensure the next of kin got their share, especially if one decoded where the treasure was? What would be the incentive of decoding the one with the description of the treasure, or the one that showed the next of kin? Analysis has been completed on the writing of the pamphlet and compared to the one deciphered Bill letter, and it's shown that it's very possible the same person wrote both. And another interesting point, why would he even take it back to Virginia? Well, the story states they didn't feel comfortable depositing the money in a bank in Santa Fe, which was then a Spanish town, and that makes sense. But why not take it to St. Louis, where there were reliable banks, instead of hauling it over thousands of miles of wilderness back to Virginia? 
In all likelihood, the entire thing was a hoax written by James B. Ward in 1885 to sell his pamphlet and make a little money, or for some other strange reason. Although if it was real, one of the simplest explanations is Bill's party went and got their share of the gold, which is why none of it has ever been found. Other smaller theories point to something like a Freemason allegory that teaches its moral by not just stating it, but having the reader pursue or be tempted to pursue an illusion. There's also the theory that the federal government, usually the NSA, broke the code and then disguised themselves as the U.S. Forestry Service and already dug it up. On the morning of November 12, 1945, 74-year-old Mitty Rivers of Bennington, Vermont, would go on a hunting trip with his son-in-law, Joe Lozon, and a few others. At some point, the two would come to a fork in the trail, and Mitty decided to head on up a few yards to the camp. But when the others arrived shortly afterwards, he was nowhere in sight. They were not worried at first, since he was an experienced woodsman and guide. But as 3 p.m. came and went, Mitty never made it. The rest of the hunting party would start to worry and would search the spot he was last seen, as well as the surrounding area, but they did not come across a sign of him. They eventually rushed to call authorities. It was at this point an extensive search was conducted, bringing in 300 residents and soldiers from nearby Fort Devens, who combed the area for eight days, but the only thing found was a single rifle cartridge that was laying in a stream. It's thought that Meaty had leaned over and the cartridge fell out of his pocket. Authorities weren't sure what happened, but since he was an experienced outdoorsman who was familiar with the area, theories of him getting lost were ruled out. In fact, he was acting as a guide for the group of hunters. He was never found, but this was only the start, because the Bennington Triangle, as it became to be known, was a phrase created by author Joseph A. Citro to describe an area of southwest Vermont that a number of strange disappearances occurred in the years between 1945 and 1950. The boundaries of this triangle are not exactly defined, but it is centered around the Glastonbury Mountain and the towns surrounding it, especially Bennington. The second disappearance would happen over a year later on December 1st, 1946, around 2.45 p.m., when 18-year-old Bennington College sophomore Paula Weldon set out on a hike on the Lone Trail. Many people saw her, including a local newspaper employee who gave her directions. She was not wearing a jacket at the time, and it was around 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and dropped down to 41. Paula was allegedly seen by an older couple who were about 100 yards behind her. According to them, she turned a corner on the trail, and when they reached the same corner, Paula was not sighted. The school president called her parents, who confirmed she had not came home. An extensive search would be conducted, and a $5,000 reward was posted by the FBI, but no evidence was ever found. Her case would become the most prominent, probably because she was a young, beautiful girl from a prominent Connecticut family. Since there was no professional police force at the time, her search was highly disorganized and didn't even begin until several days later. It was actually the media coverage of this chaotic search that led to the formation of the Vermont State Police. Some theories about this one indicate that Paula met her boyfriend on the trail and the two went to Canada while the most likely scenario is she froze to death. Yet, finding no remains is odd. Three years later to the day, December 1st, 1949, James E. Tedford, a World War I veteran living in the Bennington Soldier's home, went to visit relatives in St. Albans, about a three-hour drive away. He was then accompanied back to a local bus station where he was never seen again. According to witnesses, Tedford got on the bus and was still aboard at the last stop before Bennington. Somewhere between that stop and Bennington, he simply vanished. His belongings were still in the luggage rack, and an open bus timetable was on his vacant seat. This story has become kind of legendary, as it is said he vanished into thin air while riding the bus. But in reality, there's a gap of time between when he was last seen and when he was reported missing a week later. There's also some conjecture that he may have had some mental issues at the time, which may be points to him getting off the bus elsewhere and possibly going to a whole new town and starting over. Regardless, he was never seen again. Then we move forward to October 12th, 1950. Eight-year-old Paul Jepson was with his mother in a truck when she would walk away from the vehicle to go feed the pigs. This took about an hour in total, and when she returned, Paul was missing. Now this story is a little strange. 
and there's not a lot of info on it. It's hard to imagine a mother leaving her child alone in a vehicle for an hour like this. There's also some indication that Paul may have had autism, which was not a term used in that time period, and he may have gotten out of the truck and wandered off on his own. Search parties were formed to look, but nothing was ever found. Making this one stranger was Paul was wearing a bright red jacket that should have made him easy to spot. Bloodhounds tracked the scent to a local highway, and it's here that, according to legend, the scent stopped at the same spot where Paula Weldon had disappeared four years earlier. But just 16 days after this, 53-year-old Frida Langer and her cousin Herbert Eisner left the campsite near the Somerset Reservoir to go on a hike. Frida would at some point fall into a stream. After getting out, she would tell Herbert if he would wait, she would go back to camp, change clothes, and catch back up with him. But when she did not return, Herbert would go back to camp to find her. It was here that the rest of the campers would tell him that Frida had never came back and that they had not seen her. Over the next two weeks, five different searches were conducted, including helicopters and up to 300 searchers, but not one trace of Frida was found. It would actually be about a half a year later, on May 12, 1951, where her body was found three and a half miles from the campsite in an area that had only been lightly searched before. No cause of death could be determined. These five cases are not connected in any other way other than the time period and geographic area, but there are other similarities, such as they all disappeared around 3 to 4 p.m. and within the last three months of the year. With theories, let's start with the basic ones. A serial killer is often proposed, but the variance in victims doesn't fit the MO of a serial killer, while a more skeptical approach is that it comes down to the dense forest, rugged terrain, and the fact that the area is remote. It's also possible that they just fell into unmarked mine shafts and wells, while animal attacks are considered a small possibility. The other theories are pretty outlandish. Some cite a Bigfoot-type creature abducting people, as there are a ton of Sasquatch sightings in the area, even going back to the early 1800s. But one thing actually kind of going for this theory is, just two years prior to when all this started, back in 1943, in a case that is sometimes linked to the Canonical Five, a hunter named Carl Herrick went missing during a hunting trip in a ghost town called Glastonbury, about a 30-minute ride from Bennington. His body was discovered three days later, and it was surrounded by giant footprints, or sometimes cited as bear-like footprints. His death was odd. He had been squeezed so tight that it caused his ribs to puncture his lungs, which has led many Sasquatch believers to point out that the disappearances are all Bigfoot related. Finally, we come to the more paranormal ones, like the mountain is a cursed area that is a window to paranormal activity. A lot of this comes from the indigenous Americans who used to inhabit the area. There's also the talk of a UFO or a Wendigo. On the night of June 28, 1978, in downtown Boston, Police would be called to an Irish-themed pub, which also doubled as a late-night disco club, to find a horrifying scene. A 34-year-old man named John Kelly, who was now the manager of the pub, but was previously the former Channel 7 Boston Television investigative news anchorman, was found lying down with two gunshot wounds to the head. He was in a cramped, blood-spattered basement, along with the bodies of 37-year-old Charles McGarrian, 31-year-old, Peter Maroth, 34-year-old, Freddie De La Vega, and the pub's owner, 35-year-old, Vincent Salamante. These four men were all known criminals to the police. It appeared that they had been killed in the middle of a game of backgammon that they had started after the disco closed. The bodies had been discovered by the janitor when he came in for work. Detectives began their investigation and came up with the theory that the men were surprised at 2 a.m., headed into the basement where they were then shot by one or more intruders with at least one shotgun and a 25 caliber semi-automatic pistol. Detectives found a small arsenal of firearms and small quantities of cocaine and marijuana, as well as $15,000 in loose cash in the safe. Because of this, robbery was ruled out, and instead, it was ruled a classic gangland-style slaying, which went back to a dispute over a sale of several kilos of cocaine, although some sources dispute this and claim that it was over greed citing that three pounds of cocaine with a street value of $300,000 was stolen from the club that night and it was selling on the streets just six hours later. 
The main targets were John Kelly and his partner and friend, Vincent Salamante. Kelly was an interesting case within itself, an investigative journalist who was deeply attracted to the mobster lifestyle. He worked hard on making contacts with the mob, and he seemed to love it. He eventually became what you may call a fringe member of the mob. He was eventually fired from his journalist gig, but he had plans of coming back as a producer. He was set to come back within two to three weeks before he was murdered. The suspects are probably obvious. James Whitey Bulger, the leader of the Winter Hill Gang, Stephen Flemmy, a former member of the gang and ex-informant for the FBI, Nicholas Femia, an associate of the gang, James Martirano, an associate of the gang and contract killer, finally, Robert Italiano, and William Irardi, also associates of the gang. It could have been one or some of these men, with Nicholas Femia usually being listed as the top suspect. A little change of pace on this one, because this mystery is no longer unsolved. 17-year-old Brittany Drexel of New York was staying with a friend at a hotel in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina for spring break on April 25th, 2009. She walked to another hotel a short distance away, texted her boyfriend to say she was headed back, and that was the last time anyone spoke to her. 13 years later, in May 2022, police arrested 62-year-old Raymond Moody for murder, kidnapping, and assault. He pled guilty to all charges and her remains were found a week later in Georgetown, about an hour's drive away. To make things worse, Moody had previously served a 20-year sentence for the kidnapping and assault of a nine-year-old girl, proving that criminals of these types should never be let out. And that's where Moody finds himself today, life in prison. Crop circles are mysterious circular depressions they were first described in the Middle Ages, but only started gaining media attention in 1990. They appeared in southern England grain fields and for a long time stumped scientists. In 1990 alone, over 1,000 crop circles were reported, but it was the ones that popped up in Manitoba that concern our mystery. It started on the farm of Joe Thomas Chesky. Joe would come up on a circle and at first assumed someone had drove into his field and performed donuts with the vehicle. But upon closer inspection, he saw no obvious tire tracks in the area. He would contact a crop circle investigator who would actually go to the scene and compared it to the ones found in England. Theories are few. One crazy one states that it might be the result of mating hedgehogs running around in circles. Some point to a wind vortex, but of course the big theory is that of aliens, possibly UFOs leaving their mark when they park. There's not a lot on this one, but one study found the 80% of crop circles were proven to be hoaxes. Is there an active serial killer that has been terrorizing the south and west sides of Chicago since 1999? That's the question that is the center of this next mystery. There are at least 50 victims, but possibly more, and mostly black women, who are all seemingly murdered in a similar fashion. But just because they were murdered in a similar fashion, that doesn't mean it was the same suspect, right? Well, that's what the Chicago police believe. They claim that there is no serial killer working in Chicago and that what you see is just a string of random murders over one reason or another. But many dispute this and cite that the many similarities, such as location, method, and victimology, points to one of the most lethal serial killers who has operated in the past two decades. The numbers are appalling. Between 1999 and 2018, at least 75 women between the ages of 18 and 58 were found strangled to death in Chicago. By the end of 2019, 24 of these were solved. The other 51, well, only one of those has been solved since. These other 50, well, they are more alike than different. All of the women were found dumped in the south or west side neighborhoods, usually in abandoned buildings or alleyways. About 47% of the victims had a history of sex work while three-fourths of them were black. They were also killed in a brutal fashion, assaulted and beaten. Some were bound and gagged. Some had plastic bags tied over their heads. Some were set on fire, and most of them were stripped of clothing. The oldest unsolved one is that of Angela Ford, who vanished after leaving home to pick up her children's report cards in 1999. She was found strangled and unconscious, and eventually died in 2001 after being in a coma for a year and a half. Another 
Gwendolyn Williams, was found murdered in 2002, while in 2007, two victims were found within 48 hours of each other. Teresa Bunn, who was eight months pregnant, found strangled, stripped, thrown into a dumpster, and set on fire, while Hazel Lewis was found in burning trash behind an elementary school. Despite the darkness of the subject, it has gotten little media attention until recent years, when the theory of the so-called Chicago Strangler popped up. A man named Thomas Hargrove started the Murder Accountability Project, or MAP for short, to track the murders in Chicago. It's his work that points toward the serial killer theory. His research found that almost all the victims were found outdoors, often in alleyways or abandoned properties. Three-fourths of them had a sexual component, while most of them were partially disrobed or completely nude. He cited the odds were stronger that most of these women were killed by men who killed before and not 50 separate men. He also noted the killing stopped in 2014 and picked back up in 2017, suggesting he was briefly incarcerated. To the police's credit, they met with Hargrove in 2017 to look at his collected data, yet they dismissed it, saying you can't look at dots on a map and try to make a connection. Instead, they have to work with what they know and what they can prove. Another Chicago Police Department spokesperson took it a step further, saying there was absolutely no evidence suggesting a serial killer, and to conclude that would be careless by the detectives. They further back up their claims with the fact that they have collected 21 pieces of evidence from about half of the crime scenes, and that DNA is different in each case. Furthermore, there's not one link that connects any of them. Yet defenders of the serial killer theory believe that the police just aren't trying hard enough because they are black women or because half of them were involved in sex work, while many of them were struggling with addiction and poverty, and claim that upon talking to detectives about these cases, they give the appearance they either have no idea what's going on or they don't really care. But Thomas Hargrove has taken it a step further. They believe the killer is a man named Darren Dion Van. He strangled multiple women in Gary, Indiana and hid their bodies in buildings before he was arrested in 2014. He also confessed to killing several people in Illinois. But again, police dispute this. So I'll leave it up to you. Do you believe there is a serial killer operating in Chicago? Let me know in the comment section below. December 29th, 2003, 27-year-old Corey Ottenbright would meet with an organization called Project Care, which is really just a task force launched by the RCMP in response to the remains of nine women found in rural areas of Canada between 1988 and 2003. The task force would collect the hair samples from sex workers to add to the growing DNA database, as well as launching a website to provide people with resources and a tip line. Corey, who was a sex worker, would voluntarily meet with them to give them personal information and a hair sample for the sole purpose of assisting police in the event she went missing. So it's somewhat strange that would be exactly what happened. Because four months later, on April 21st, 2004, Corey would meet with Project Care early that morning before walking back down the street and out of sight. This would be her last confirmed sighting. Three months later, on July 15th, Project Care was contacted by another government agency who was looking for Corey for a personal matter. Project Care would follow up by fanning out to policing and community partners to search for Corey, but this search failed. Detectives would then be called and start working on the case and found out that on May 9th, Corey left her home in central Edmonton at 10 p.m. with the intention of going to work. A number of witnesses would cite her in Edmonton and Alberta, but these could not be confirmed. And that would basically be it as far as the search went. Sightings stopped and the case went cold, for a decade at least, when a landowner on April 19th, 2015 would find human remains on his rural property near Leduc. A police search of the surrounding area resulted in the discovery of other remains in the area. These would be identified about two weeks later as a woman named Dolores Brower. Brower had last been seen in Edmonton around the same time as Corey in May 2004. The remains were also found within five miles of another woman, Katie Belantine, who was found in 2003, and then another set of remains were found in 2012, that of Amber Tucaro. But it's the same area 
that Corey Ottenbrot was found. So obviously, a serial killer is suspected. There's not a lot out there on this one. Two early suspects were that of Thomas Sebekla and Joseph Lybuchen, who are already behind bars for killing other sex workers, both serving life sentences. Beginning in 2015, the Delhi International Airport would start to have some weird experiences. It seems that every month, for about two years, six to seven reports would come in from pilots who would see different objects in the air near the airport, and this time, it was not UFOs of alien origin. These objects ranged from balloons, flying parasails, drones, and laser lights, which can cause pilots to have a tough time landing or taking off. With the laser lights, the pilots were able to give details of height and altitude based on where they were when they were targeted, but objects like balloons or drones are more difficult and made worse by the fact that they are not detected by radar. In almost every case, the pilot was about five nautical miles away from Delhi, which means the laser originated from outside the capital. Personnel at a watchtower noticed a balloon on one occasion and pursued it. By the time they reached the location, it was about 80 to 90 feet off the ground, which presumably means that the person had just released it minutes ago. Again in this one, there's just not a lot of info, but the general consensus is that someone, or maybe a group, was intentionally trying to screw a pilot's coming in and out of Delhi, for what purpose is unknown. I can't believe we are seven layers down and still discussing poopers. This time, we go to Denver, Colorado, where North Park Hill residents would be stunned and disgusted by a man who appeared to be exercising and in the middle of his workout would pull his pants down in broad daylight and let go, using the local alleyway as his toilet. And just so you get the full picture, this was not a moment where he got sick or something. He was bringing toilet paper with him, so it was a pre-planned dump. He would be captured on surveillance camera, but never identified. Fashion trends are a fickle thing. They easily come and go, and many times, we can look back at trends and wonder how they ever got popular to begin with. But there's at least one trend that not only went away, but the process to make the fabric, called Dhaka muslin, has completely been forgotten. It came onto the scene nearly 200 years ago in 18th century Europe. And when it came to the scene, it made a splash, because anybody who wore this clothing basically looked naked. The reason is the aforementioned fabric, a precious material imported from the city of the same name in what is now known as Bangladesh. It was made in an elaborate 16-step process with a rare cotton that only grew along the banks of the Migna River. It was considered one of the greatest treasures of the age. There were many different types, but just like today, they had great marketing names. Woven Air, Even and Dew, and Flowing Water, just to name a few. They were said to be as light and soft as the wind. Accounts from the day cited the material was so fluid, you could put 300 foot of it easily through a center of a ring, while another count claimed you could fit a 60-foot piece of it in a small box. In the UK, the material pretty much killed the highly structured dresses that the aristocracy wore. The days of those dresses with five-foot waistlines were out the door. Now the women were wearing these delicate straight-up-and-down chemise gowns, which was a shock for society since they were essentially wearing what was once considered as underwear, and this underwear you could see right through. It became the most expensive fabric in Europe with fans such as French Queen Marie Antoinette. But by the early 20th century, it had completely disappeared, and the convoluted technique to make it was forgotten. And that cotton that was used to make it before went extinct. So how did all this happen? These plants, once grown, would produce a single flower twice a year, which gave way to a snowy florid of cotton fibers. But these fibers were not ordinary fibers. Unlike the long slender strands that make up to 90% of the cotton industry. These threads were stumpy and easily frayed. They were useless for making cheap cloth and industrial machinery, but the locals were able to develop an ingenious method for taming the fibers. It was a 16-step process that, crazily enough, had to be carried out by a specialist for each step. It was carried from village to village, 
so that these individual experts could do their part. A truly communal effort. The weaving itself could take months, depending on if you wanted designs like flowers integrated into it, but the results were worth it. A minutely detailed artwork rendered into silvery silky strands. It blew the Europeans' minds, where it was rumored that it was actually created by fairies, ghosts, or even mermaids. Now, it's not fair to say that the process has been completely lost, because it actually still continues today, except it used ordinary cotton. But the part of the knowledge that has been lost is how they achieved the thread counts. Higher thread counts are what made the material softer. They also wore better over time, because the more strands there are, the more that will remain to hold the fabric together. So how different is it now compared to then? The process now nets thread counts that fall between 40 and 80, which means it contains roughly that number of crisscrossing horizontal and vertical threads per square inch. Daka muslin, on the other hand, has 800 to 1200 thread counts, 10 times the amounts of what are made now, and nobody knows how they done it. But this is all because by 1793, the British East India Company conquered the Mughal Empire, and less than a century later, the region was controlled by the British Raj, and it wouldn't take long for them to demand more of this fabric for a cheaper price. They came down hard on the industry and put a stranglehold on the production. Weavers couldn't keep up and fell into debt because they were paid up front for the cloth, which could take a year to make. But if the fabric was deemed not good enough, the weaver had to pay the money back. The Brits also recorded each step in meticulous detail, and textile baron Samuel Odno, with his state-of-the-art technology of the time, the spinning wheel, started making a generic version of the muslin using regular cotton that had way less quality, but also much cheaper. Although at least one dark legend says that the English cut off the thumbs of all the weavers to prevent them from making muslin anymore, that's not true. In the past decade, there's been a project to try and recreate it by finding cotton plants that appear to be a relative to the original plant used. They found one in the wild that was a 70% match. They then began working with weavers to refine their techniques. So far, six muslin saris have been made. These were produced with 300 thread counts, which is nice, but still a ways to go to reach the 800 to 1200 thread counts. Dundas Island is a small island off the north coast of British Columbia, Canada, and it plays host to a cryptid that has almost zero information about it. According to this mystery, the Dundas Island black fly are flies that can grow about five to six inches in length and have large stingers and are almost completely black except for the head, eyes, and tip of the abdomen. When they catch their prey, they drink their blood as well as eating the flesh of their catch. They are said to hunt for hours and only give up if the prey leaves the island, which is sort of ironic because it seems like the fly itself is stuck there. After a kill, they will also use the carcass as an incubator for their young laying eggs in the remains. These eggs hatch in a few days and the hatchling larvae feed off the husk for about a week before cocooning. A few days later, a new fly emerges. At this stage, they are about the size of a horsefly, but quickly reach full maturity in another week to 10 days. It's said that the natives of the area refuse to go to this island out of fear and that that may be due to the fact that the black fly's venom is strong enough to kill a cow. However, there's no concrete proof this cryptid exists. For the year and a half that I have done this channel, we have looked at numerous missing person cases, and I would say the majority of them probably ended badly. But what about a missing persons case that potentially ended well? That's what we have here with Ettore Meruana. Now this guy, he wasn't just a regular dude. He was actually an Italian theoretical physicist who worked on neutrino masses, and he was actually quite distinguished. Enrico Fermi, the same physicist who created the famous Fermi paradox, would compare Ettore to geniuses like Galilei and Newton. But it's his disappearance and possible reappearance that he is probably most remembered for now. It started in 1938 when he would withdraw all of his money from his bank account and take a trip from Naples to Palermo. Now nobody is sure why he took this trip, but it's thought he may have been planning to visit his friend Emilio Segre, another physicist and professor 
but Segre was actually in California at the time, so Ettore would send a note from Palermo to Antonio Corelli, director of the Naples Physic Institute, that read, Dear Corelli, I made a decision that has become unavoidable. There isn't a bit of selfishness in it, but I realize what trouble my sudden disappearance will cause you and the students. For this as well, I beg your forgiveness, but especially for betraying the trust, the sincere friendship, and the sympathy you have gave me for the past months. Strangely, he would end the note by saying, I will keep a fond memory of them all at least until 11 p.m. tonight, possibly later too, which kind of sounds like a suicide note. After this, Ettore quickly sent another telegram, canceling earlier traveling plans. Then, while still in Palermo, Ettore would purchase a ticket on March 25th for a boat trip to return back to Naples, and he was never seen again. Many investigations have been done over the decades, but his fate is uncertain, but that hasn't stopped theories. First was a theory that was made by an Italian writer who, after reviewing results of several investigations, concluded that Ettore had moved to Argentina and lived a quiet life. However, all of his colleagues disputed this, which opens the door for more theories. At least one of his other colleagues did suggest suicide, while others suggested he died in a kidnapping or murder. Another theory was that he had become a beggar or joined a monastery. This one in particular came from a bishop of Tropani in the 60s who claimed that he had been Ettore's confessor and that Ettore had faced a spiritual crisis so he moved to a convent. There's also a theory that he joined the Third Reich to help their nuclear program, while others state he was actually killed by the Third Reich out of fear his work could lead to an atomic bomb before they could. Some of his family even thinks he fled because he may have been gay and his safety was not guaranteed in fascist Italy. But let's go back to the Argentina theory, or South America in general. This all started back in 2008, when a man contacted an Italian TV show that was discussing the case, and he told them he was convinced he had met Ettore several times in Argentina, although he went by the name Mr. Benny. He was also told by a friend that this Mr. Benny was really a famous physicist, so it was kinda like an open secret. The case was actually reopened in 2011, and the Rome Attorney's Office announced an inquiry into a statement made by the witness about meeting Ettore in Buenos Aires in the years after World War II. It was just three months after this that a photo of a man taken in 1955 in Argentina would be analyzed, and it was found that there were 10 points of similarity with Ettore's face. But it doesn't end there, because on February 4th, 2015, Rome Attorney's Office released a statement declaring that Ettore had been alive between 1955 and 1959 and was living in Valencia, Venezuela. Based upon the new evidence, the office officially declared the case closed. There was no criminal evidence with his disappearance, and they determined he was most likely a personal choice to immigrate to Venezuela. Why he did, no one knows. Although I think this one is technically solved, especially since Italian authorities have closed the case. Some still dispute that he went to South America and insist the case is still unsolved. March 2002. A park ranger of Exmoor National Park in southwest England would come across some black bags that had been dumped in the area. This was not unusual, as locals tended to bring trash here. The ranger would pick up the bag, but didn't bother to look inside, and instead took it to a local incinerator. It would lay there days before the employees there opened it and looked inside. Inside the black plastic bags was a green single bed sheet. Also inside the package was a white pillowcase used by a linen hire service, but inside all of this were human remains. Also found was a wire from a stereo that may have been used to tie up this individual. Detectives would go back out to where the bag had been discovered. Here they found alongside him a number of items including underwear and a distinctive gold pendant featuring a verse from the Quran. Because the body was so decomposed, an identification could not be made. So authorities made a reconstruction and aired it on television in 2002, but no one ever came forward to identify the man. Authorities don't even know how the man died. They believed he was in his mid-20s to mid-30s and may have been from North Africa or the Asian subcontinent. He was about five foot nine with dark hair. 
It's thought he had lived in the UK for a decade before his death and may have spent time in southern England and it's led to the belief that someone in the area had to know him. There was also evidence to suggest he suffered a brutal death between the years 1999 and 2000, some two years before his body was dumped at the park, meaning his body was stored somewhere else for that two-year period. Despite exhaustive investigations over the years and a full DNA profile, nobody knows who he is. Some theories are that the man was a refugee illegally working in the local area, perhaps in the hospitality industry, and he just kept to himself. Whoever hired him could not report he was missing without exposing themselves for hiring unlawful workers. Another thought was the man was involved in some type of illegal activity, perhaps a gang. Another thought is that he was in the country legally, but lived a solitary life and no one knew him or thought to report him, and just assumed he left the area, or that he was part of a family who had something to do with his murder and never reported it, or he could have just had a dispute with a local. As far as the two-year period goes between his death and being found, there's the thought that he was stored in code storage at some place he was working at, or was stored in a basement. February 22nd, 2015, F1 race car driver Fernando Alonso was test driving his McLaren MP430 during a Formula One preseason test session at the Circuit de Barcelona, Catalonia, when he suddenly veered off and crashed into a wall at turn three. Another driver behind him said the crash looked strange and noted he was only going about 93 mile an hour. There was not significant damage from the impact, but Alonso was seemingly unable to exit the cockpit. Medical crew rushed to the field where they performed first aid. He was then airlifted to a hospital and diagnosed with a concussion that forced him to miss the Australian Grand Prix that opened the season. This crash was pretty unusual to the sport and has led to numerous rumors and theories online as to just what caused it. What is known is that the cameras and other sources captured the crash, yet none of it has ever been leaked. According to the car company, the crash was simply the result of unpredictable gusty winds and refuted that there was any issues with the vehicle. But weeks after the crash, Alonso claimed that his car suffered from lock steering and refuted the team's wind explanation. This was only made stranger by the fact that the vehicle was not severely damaged, but was withdrawn for further testing. One theory was that because Honda had just recently returned to the sport and they had been experiencing troubles with its electronic energy recovery systems, that Alonso either ended up becoming unconscious or drowsy from inhaling toxic battery fumes or may have even received an electric shock. Both McLaren and Alonso's manager denied this, however. Another theory suggested Alonso was simply knocked out due to the odd way the car hit the wall at an impact angle, which resulted in Alonso taking the brunt of the impact. Making things more confusing was McLaren claimed Alonso was uninjured, while in the same document, the racing director stated he was concussed, while the team's boss said he just had symptoms of a concussion, which led to speculation that he suffered worse than a concussion. Some rumors even state he suffered memory loss for a week. This is a lost media mystery, and the only thing released is a series of photos taken after the accident and two recordings showing Alonso just before the crash and just after the crash. Nothing else has ever been publicly released, which is odd. January 9th, 1968, 16-year-old Jacqueline Dunleavy finished her shift at a local store in London, Ontario, and made the two-block walk back to the bus stop since she did not have a vehicle. But sadly, Jacqueline would never make it home, but Jackie's parents were very proactive with this, and that might be due to the fact her father was a police officer, because it only took her being late by 30 minutes before they jumped into action. They would start a search for their teenage daughter, but sadly, it was still too late, because just two hours later, her body would be discovered at 8.10 p.m. by three teenagers near a children's psychiatric hospital. She had been beaten in the head, but it's unsure what was used. Her scarf had also been tied around her neck. She was partially clothed with genitals exposed. She also had a pink facial tissue stuffed in her mouth. Detectives launched their investigation, but did not get very far. The only clue they got was one witness seen her on her walk to the bus stop 
when a white four-door sedan pulled up and Jackie got in. Now, I wish I could say this was the end of the mystery, but sadly, it's just getting started. Because on November 14th, 1968, 19-year-old Linda White would take her French exam at Western University, which is also in London, Ontario. After exiting the university, she was never seen again. This one would be a bit different though, because Linda's remains were not found for four years. And strangely, when she was found, her left arm had been removed from the elbow down. And according to investigators, this wasn't from animal scavenging, but instead was intentional. Then we jump ahead to October 4th, 1969, still in London. 15-year-old Jackie English was on her way home from her waitress job at the Metropolitan. But unfortunately for Jackie and her family, she never made it. The authorities were called and her steps were retraced and they found a witness that stated they had seen Jackie walking towards the bus stop and at the Wellington Road South overpass, she would instead get inside a car that had pulled up. This was the last confirmed sighting for her. Eyewitness accounts of the driver, as well as the color of the car, have been buried and didn't lead to anything. Her family didn't have to wait long to get the devastating news because five days later, in a rural area about 45 minutes from where she was picked up, her body was discovered nude in Big Otter Creek. There were signs of assault as two semen samples were found. Her clothes were found strewn along the highway a few days later. Her cause of death was ruled blunt force trauma, most likely a crowbar or hammer. Detectives would start to look deeper into Jackie's life, and it's here they found a detailed diary that she kept, one that she partially wrote in code and tucked away in the pages was a picture of an unknown man. This man is unidentified to this day, and it is worth noting, he is not necessarily a suspect. About a year later, on August 14th, 1970, 15-year-old Soraya O'Connell went missing after attending a community dance held at a youth center. She left at 9.45 p.m. She told her friends she intended to hitchhike home, which was just three miles away, and again, this was the last time she was seen alive. It would be four years later when her remains were found. This one is a bit different in the fact that little was known about how she died or if she was even assaulted, but her case is often linked with the other three. So obviously, the city of London had a serial killer on the loose, but the investigation went nowhere. And that might be due to one odd fact, because you see, London did not just have one serial killer operating during this time period. They had three more. Now, I'm not sure of the serial killer statistics, but I would have to think it is an anomaly to have four active serial killers in a city at the same time. Actually, for comparison's sake, that's like a city the size of New York having 80 to 90 serial killers operating at once. That's how bad it was in London at this time. There was Gerald Thomas Archer, aka the London Chambermaid Slayer, a man who killed three hotel maids between 1969 and 1971, Russell Johnson, meanwhile, killed over seven victims between 1973 and 1977, while Christian McGee, aka the Mad Slasher, killed three women between 1974 and 1976. So as you can see, the London PD had their hands full from 1968 to 1977. So it's not really a shock that at least one of these slipped through the cracks. And that's where we come to our mystery, that of the Forest City Killer. The man that killed Jackie English, Jacqueline Dunleavy, Linda White, and possibly Soraya O'Connell was never captured. But was it really one man? The serial killer theory for the so-called Forest City Killer is actually just that, a theory presented by author Vanessa Brown, who likens it to Canada's version of the Golden State Killer. She believes there is a good chance he is still alive and living in the area and that there is enough DNA evidence to make a familial DNA connection. But she's not the only one. Dennis Alsop, an Ontario Provincial Police Inspector who, during this time period, worked on the cases. He kept a lot of diaries, paperwork, documents, and basically everything about the murders. And he would go back periodically throughout his life and try to solve it. He passed away in 2012, and his son found a huge stash while going through his things. It's for this reason we know so much about the murders, and it's also where the serial killer theory got started, because that was the line of thought that the inspector was following. But these four murders 
are not the only ones that have been linked. In her book, Vanessa Brown goes on to link nine-year-old boy Frankie Jensen, who was abducted and murdered a month after Jacqueline Dunleavy. And just like Jacqueline, he was found with tissue stuffed in his mouth. Another was that of 16-year-old Scott Leishman, who was found strangled and thrown into the water nude just a month after Frankie Jensen had been. He was also seen getting into a white sedan, just like Jacqueline. Then there's 31-year-old Helga Beer, who was beaten and strangled on August 5th of that year. She was found nude from the waist down in the back of her own car. She was seen talking to a man that her friends did not know. He was in his late 20s and was a white man, around 5 foot 10, with dark hair. Finally, Vanessa links 11-year-old Bruce Stapleton, who disappeared from his home on June 7th while he was outside playing. He was found about 6 miles from where Frankie Jensen's body was found and where Scott Leishman was abducted. But the problem with this theory is, obviously, these different types of victims don't fit the typical serial killer MO. In fact, Canadian authorities have never stated a serial killer theory and lean more to all these being random murders, or at the least, were done by several different individuals. In fact, with the first victim, Jacqueline Dunleavy, there's a lot of speculation. She was familiar with the suspect, and that pretty much goes for every one of these cases. But some sleuths do believe the canonical four are related to a serial killer nicknamed the Forest City Killer, but they do not agree that he was responsible for the later four, that of Frankie Jensen, Scott Leishman, Helga Beer, and Bruce Stapleton. While some sleuths believe there is no such thing as a Forest City Killer, and instead chalk up these murders to three to four other uncaptured serial killers, which if that's the case, means there was a total of about seven to eight serial killers running around London at this time. And again, for context, that would be like 133 serial killers operating in New York City at one time. Regardless, if it is just one killer, there are a couple of potential suspects, both theorized by the author and at one time, some police detectives. First was a man named Glenn Fryer, who was the former principal at Children's Psychiatric Research Institute. And if you remember, Jacqueline Dunleavy's body was found near a child psychiatric hospital. But going a step further, we look at Jackie English's murder again. A woman named Betty Harrison was a witness who came forward and placed Glenn Fryer as the man who picked up Jackie that evening. And Fryer would ultimately end up stabbing Betty over this. But the case would end up being a media circus and somehow ended up with an acquittal. From the vibe I get, it seemed like the public both thought Fryer and Betty were just crazy. Fryer would then be ruled out as a suspect in Jackie's murder, although some still try to link him to the others. Another suspect was that of a man named David Bodimer. He was convicted of killing a woman named Georgia Jackson and served 10 years of a life sentence on a non-capital murder charge before he was paroled early. The murder was very similar to others. However, just like with the previous case, there's a lot of doubt that surrounds it. Many think he was unjustly convicted in the murder of Georgia Jackson, while others think that not only was he guilty of that one, but several more. But I ask you, what do you think? Was there a Forest City serial killer? Let me know in the comment section below. And that brings us to the conclusion of this installment of the Unsolved Mysteries Mega Iceberg Explained. I hope you enjoyed. Goodbye and good night.